for joining us. And I am indeed grateful to the Indian College of Anesthesiologists, Indian Society, uh, Indian Association of CT Surgeons, and the Bangalore Chapter of ISCM for um, being associated with us to conduct this educational program. Before I invite the you know, faculty for today, I would like to request all the participants to keep their mics muted and uh, audios off, uh, the video off till the end of the session, till the end of the talk, after which you can unmute if you want to ask any question or pass a comment. Alternate, alternatingly, you can post your questions or comments on the chat box. Uh, with this introductory words, I would like to introduce Dr. Rakesh Nayak, who is Associate Professor in Cardiothoracic Surgery in Jayadeva Institute of Cardiology. As you are aware, Jayadeva Institute of Cardiology is one of the biggest cardiology centers in the nation, if not in the world. And we are lucky to have Dr. Rakesh Nayak today. And we have the speaker from Delhi, GP Panth Hospital, Rachna Vadwa, who is again an accomplished uh, uh, cardiothoracic anesthesiologist. With this, I would like to request Rakesh to conduct the um, meeting. Thank you so much. Thanks for joining us. A very good morning to all of you. Thanks for the invite, sir. So today's speaker is an eminent speaker. Her name is uh, Dr. Rachna Vadva. She's uh, a professor in DIU at uh, GB Panth uh, Hospital, New Delhi. The main areas of interest are perioperative care. And uh, she's uh, keen to teach uh, her students. She has various publications in um, national and uh, international journals, she's close to 50. And she has also authored a couple of chapters in various uh, national level books. So she's editorial board of Indian Journal of Clinical Anesthesia. She's a life member in IJA, IACTA, as well as IJCA. She has total experience of close to 20. So today's topic of discussion would be mainly the forgotten walls, that is tricuspid and the pulmonary valve through the transesophageal echocardiogram. Madam, I hand over the question. Thank you, sir. Thank you for the kind Thank introduction. And I begin with my slides. So the, today's topic is tricuspid and pulmonary valve, and I don't have any disclosures. So the objectives of this will be, I'll be illustrating the anatomy, the different STE assessment views, the pathologies of tricuspid and pulmonary valves, and the various interventions that are possible in these two valves. So sir is right in saying that tricuspid valve was a forgotten valve from long, and uh, but now it has become noticed from neglected. So in today's scenario, in even in the last two, three years, the cardiology people, they're working a lot on it and we're coming out with the three-dimensional and intracardiac echocardiography, not only for assessment and monitoring as well as for interventions. So TE was the first tool that was start trans thoracic, then trans esophageal echocardiography, 2D came into view and then 3D TE, but today we are like working on four-dimensional uh, TE as well as uh, intracardiac echocardiography for all these tricuspid assessment as well as uh, live uh, watching for their repairs. So this article came in 2022. This article came in 2021 by American College of Cardiology Foundation. And this is a beautiful article uh, just telling us about transthoracic and transesophageal and 3D assessment for tricuspid valve repair as well as repairment uh, as replacement. So uh, this is the anatomical description of both the valves where we can see the tricuspid valve having three cusps, medial, anterior, and posterior. And on the anterior is the uh, pulmonary valve. Pulmonary valve is most anteriorly placed. So this has got the anterior cusp, left cusp, and right cusp. So this is alignment of all the four valves in one view. And this is seen from the above. So first of all, I begin with the tricuspid valve. Uh, it is the most 
it is the largest having area of 7 to 9 cm square most apically placed and it is not planar it is it is a d shaped ellipsoid kind of structure and there is a very low gradient between right atrium and right ventricle it consists of annulus leaflets papillary muscles and caudate tendineae so the three leaflets, anterior, posterior, and septal, there are three commissures, enteroseptal, enteroposterior commissures are basically indentations. And there are three papillary muscles and the caudate tendine, they're very specific in tricuspid and the multiple caudal attachments. That is why the tricuspid valve is different from all other valves. And it is said that uh, as we've got fingerprints, as the fingerprints of every person is unique. So same as the tricuspid valve. It is not same in all. It, is, it has a different signature morphology in all individuals. So this is the uh, tricuspid valve just opened up where we have this anterior cusp, septal and posterior. Uh, this is the lancisi uh, papillary muscles, um, which connects the enteroseptal commissure. So as we can see, there are multiple caudal, uh, caudal attachments coming from single papillary muscles also. This is how this valve is different. And another thing uh, is that, uh, apart from these three papillary muscles and septal muscles, the anterior papillary muscle it connects the septal muscle by a septomarginal trabecular, which is known as the moderator band. This is what we come across whenever we are opening the RV in uh, cases of TOF. And this moderator band is very important. Its identification uh, in RV is very important. It carries the major twig of right bundle branch. And its main function is to deflect the bloodstream from inflow to outflow. So this is how the annulus uh, is saddle shaped and it is less fibrous than other annuli. It is a saddle shaped structure and we can see that the uh, highest points are in uh, enteroposterior. So this is the saddle shaped structure and this is what happens whenever there is annular dilatation. Another important thing with respect to anatomy is, is the uh, conduction system in which we can see that there is a, a triangle of cork, which is very important whenever a surgeon is doing any interventions on the tricuspid valve. This is the triangle of cork, which is formed by anteriorly by the septal leaflet, by the tendon of Todaro, and then we've got the coronary sinus. In the apex of the triangle lies the AV node. Just superior to it is the central fibrinous body housing the bundle of his. So whenever there is any intervention being done um, on uh, this area, so it is very important to be careful of the conduction system. So this is uh, application of ring and the this part, this is the triangle and this area is left free in order to keep the conduction system free. Is tricuspid valve really tricuspid? So Kavada et al. and Sunita et al. They have clearly shown in the autopsy of uh, tricuspid valves of normal heart specimens where they have found that the cusps may range from two to seven. And in their study, though it was uh, of very small uh, number of patients, like 36, so they have clearly seen that tricuspid valve is really tricuspid. So whenever we are uh, assessing the tricuspid valve, so what are the things that we should aim to see? Means what am I trying to see whenever I'm assessing the tricuspid valve? So accurate quantification of TR severity, yes, TR is more common than TS. That is why I'm, I'm like mentioning TR. So proper identification of the mechanism responsible for TR. In fact, it is apt to say 
that we may see the cusp morphology and quantification of RV dysfunction and pulmonary artery hypertension. So these are the three important things which we need to do before any intervention is contemplated on the tricuspid valve. And in today's scenario, it is 3D assessment and 4D assessment, especially for the volume measurements and not the 2D assessment alone, just because it gives values in one plane. So it may not give a precise value. So to, in today's scenario, we've got 3D assessments for volume, which are like very important for precisely uh, delineating the quantitative assessments. So what are the different views? As we all know, it is mid-esophageal, RV in, uh, uh, first of all, it is four chamber view, then mid esophageal RV inflow flow view, mid esophageal modified bicable view. These three views are the views which we primarily see for tricuspid valve assessment always and always. Then you've got trans uh, gastric basal short axis view where we can see all the three, um, uh, three cusps in one view. Otherwise, in all other views, we can see only the two. Then transgastric RV inflow view and transgastric RV inflow outflow view. These gives a very good uh, depiction of the subvalvular apparatus. So I begin with the first uh, size. Of, uh, what are the things that we should assess? The number of valve leaflets, their size, their shape, the commissures, the thickening, the mobility, if there is calcification, if any. How is the annulus? the size of the annulus, uh, the, sub the shape of the annulus, and then the subvalvular sub apparatus, the color Doppler and the spectral Doppler analysis, continuous wave Doppler and pulse wave Doppler will be giving us the values of the quantitative assessments. So these are the basic views, four chamber view, RV inflow flow view, and... Uh, uh, Bicable views, modified bicable views. So this is the four chamber view in which we can see all the four chambers. And this is the tricuspid valve. This is also known as right atrioventricular valve. So this is the first view showing uh, the pathology here is severe mitral stenosis. We can see the LA dilatation and this is spontaneous eco contrast and massive TR on the right side. So this is the 3D morphology seen from above. So this is the septal leaflet, this is the anterior and this is the posterior. Another view, this is showing torrential tricuspid regurgitation in cases of severe MS. So we can see the piece of MS being formed here. This is another view, this, I will just freeze. This is Epstein's anomaly. So in Epstein's anomaly, what we see is there is a long anterior leaflet. There is caudal uh, migration of the septal leaflet. There is uh, atrialization of the right ventricle. There is small functional RV. And because of this morphological changes, this is basically primary tricuspid regurgitation, where there is massive tricuspid regurgitation owing to the uh, pathology of the leaflets. So this is the anterior leaflet, which is long. The septal leaflet has moved caudally. So there is atrialization of right ventricle, and there is small functional right ventricle uh, in the Epstein's anomaly. So this is basically primary tricuspid uh, regurg uh, regurgitation. And uh, we've got other diseases like carcinoid tricuspid valve disease and pneumatic tricuspid valve disease, where their presentation is generally of uh, stenosis as well as regurgitation. And uh, in how do we differentiate? So in carcinoid tricuspid valve disease, there is thickening of the leaflets and reduced motion, and there is no commissural fusion. But if it is rheumatic tricuspid valve, then there is commissural fusion, shortening and retraction of leaflets, cordae, and uh, there is association of uh, rheumatic involvement of other valves like mitral as well as aortic. Though the result may be tricuspid stenosis or tricuspid regurgitation, but usually the other valves are also um, involved along with it. So this is four chamber view where uh, 
it is very important to assess the tricuspid valve annulus. So if this annulus is more than 40 millimeters or when we index it to body surface area, it is more than 21. So then it is very important that the, if the surgeon is already undergoing the left heart procedures, then right heart or the tricuspid valve should be addressed. This is RV inflow outflow view where we can uh, beautifully see this is the interatrial septum. This is the aortic valve. So uh, <clears throat> this is the tricuspid valve. This is the pulmonary valve. This is known as RV inflow outflow view. This is also known as wraparound view. Just because if you put your PA catheter, the PA catheter goes from here to here. So this view also helps in uh, knowing the position of the uh, swan gans catheter. So in this view, we, this can be anterior or septal. This is the posterior uh, uh, cusp of the tricuspid valve. So uh, seeing in the three-dimensional, so this is the anterior, posterior, septal. So this gives uh, a mirror image of this view. And this is for the quantification, for the, uh, in the 3D volume quantification for the tricuspid. This, this is again RV inflow outflow view. We can have this anterior or anterior or septal, and this is the posterior cusp. This is this is when we uh, the in the mid esophageal view, in the aortic valve short axis view. When the in, when we increase the angle to 30, 40, or 50, then we will get this RV inflow outflow view. So this is mid esophageal modified bicaval view. So if we have a bicaval view, so we see the SVC and the IVC interatrial septum, LA and RA. But if it is a modified bicaval view, we see the tricuspid valve. This is the anterior cusp and this is the posterior cusp. This view is very, very important just because in this, the uh, our Doppler line is uh, is actually aligned to tricuspid valve inflow. So all our continuous wave interrogations are based on this view and the measurement of the IVC diameters can be done here and the tri tricuspid uh, valve regurgitations uh, all can be estimated here in this view. So this is when we are at the aortic valve short axis view. We increase the angle stay to 110 to 120 degrees we will get this view and we move the probe slightly towards the right. So this is massive tricuspid regurgitation uh, in the mid esophageal bicaval view showing severe TR. So if we've got a 3D, when uh, this assessment can be done from both the perspectives, from the atrial perspective, as well as from the ventricular perspectives. If I see it from the ventricular side, so I'll see that this is the mitral valve, but from the ventricular sides, just above the uh, just above the RVOT, I can see this is the anterior, this is the posterior, and this is the septal leaflet. And if I see it from above, from the atrial side, so this is anterior, posterior, and septal. This is properly aligned, as we can see from above. So if suppose I was uh, trying to measure the right ventricular systolic pressure in the presence of TR, so this is the best view where I will have the alignment of the color Doppler. I put the uh, CW over there, continuous wave over there, and continuous wave Doppler will give us the peak gradient over here, the maximum gradient of the hair. So if it is suppose like three or four, so the gradient is four V square. So we come to know that the gradients are high here. We can, all, uh, we can also come to know about the RA pressures at times. What is important is its uh, shape and density. If suppose it is going straight up, okay, and it is very dense, this full envelope, this indicates more severe TR as compared to other scenarios. <clears throat> this is the five chamber view where I can have, where we will have mitral valve and this is the aortic valve in between, even this view, at times, this view will also give a very good assessment of the uh, tricuspid valve. 
So this now we come to transgastric views. So in this transgastric view, uh, the multiplane angle is rotated to 100 degrees. What is important is that we can see the apex of the right ventricle. So if we see the apex of the right ventricle, we will be able to delineate the anterior and posterior cusps. And this also, this view gives very good idea of the subvalvular apparatus. Another, this is uh, another case where we had severe MRTR and RV dysfunction. Though I am not covering RV dysfunction in this uh, um, presentation, but assessment of RV function goes hand in hand whenever I'm whenever we are assessing the tricuspid valve. Another view that is important is knowing the hepatic means. I think this is uh, IVC diameter RV functions and hepatic venous persuasive Doppler is very very important just because if there is systolic uh, blunting or diastolic presence, then this indicates severe TR. So all these views are very important for uh, transesophageal uh, echocardiographic assessment of the tricuspid valve. This view, uh, this is transgastric view. This shows the inferior wall, anterior wall, and this is the uh, posterior cusp. This is again a transgastric view in which uh, we have made the angle up to 100 to 120 degrees where we can see the posterior cusp, the anterior cusp is very clear. This is the right atrium, this is right ventricle. So we can see the entire inflow, we can see the RV and the, uh, uh, the movements and morphology of the posterior anterior and the subvalvular apparatus over here. So this was this, this transgastric short axis view. This is the only view where we can see all the three cusps. Though uh, it takes time to practice uh, to have this view uh, where we can see all the three cusps. So now we come to uh, whenever we are assessing. So we've done the qualitative assessment. The semi-quantitative will see that uh, this is, yes, this is massive. But now what is important is the quantitative assessment. So for this, we, uh, we will be calculating the central jet area, the all the measurements from continuous wave Doppler, the jet density and control, and the hepatic vein flow, RA, RV, and IVC sizes, and RV functions. So they all have to be assessed by TEE, 2D, or 3D, or 4D nowadays. So we have 4D machine, um, new 4D machine. I think next time I'll be coming with 4D images also. What are the common causes of TR? We should all know this. And whenever there is, what is the pathophysiology of TR? That uh, there is left and right atrial enlargement or there may be RV dilatation and dysfunction. This may lead to tricuspid valvular annular dilatation whenever there is any left-sided pathology or pulmonary disease. So the pathophysiology in cases of left-sided heart disease apart from the um, reasons of tricuspid is this. So these are again the different views where, where we, have, we have done the RV volume estimation by this in diastole as well as systole. We can have the fractional area changes in this. This is the 3D echocardiographic assessment. And in this, uh, I, we, we can calculate the uh, jet area. So what are the accepted cutoff values? So if we are uh, assessing all in the four chamber view, so RV dimension, mid RV dimension less than 33, it should be less than 33, and diastolic area should be less than 28, and systolic less than 16, fractional area change 32, and maximal 2D RA volume is uh, less than 33 ml per meter square. This is indexed, and uh, nowadays we've got 3D values, for especially for the volume assessments. So this is uh, how we calculate the effective regurgitant orifice area or regurgitant volume by knowing the PISA. This is the proximal isovelocity surface area from which we can calculate. And this is the, uh, so regurgitant flow is two pi square. This is the PISA uh, radius, and this is the aliasing velocity. So all these values can be calculated. And now nowadays with 3D probes, we have these volume estimations by just keeping the probes and 
just delineating those areas where we get want to get the volumes. So it is very important for all these evaluations, how much of the apex of the heart is made by RV is very important. So if uh, it is a chronic TR, so there are specific criteria. I will come to the severe one. So when there is dilated annulus, there is a large central jet having more than 50%. Vena contracta width is more than 0.7 centimeter. Pisa radius is more than 0.9 centimeters. There is dense triangular continuous, continuous wave jet. There is systolic reversal of hepatic venous flow. There is dilated airway with preserved frictions. All these indicate severe TR in which we need to address the right side of the heart. So different societies have given different criteria. They're more or less, they are the same. Jet area, jet area more than 10. This is given by American Society of Ecocardiogra uh, Ecocardiography. So tricuspid valve, Tricuspid valve uh, has got, it is abnormal, frail, poor coaptation. RA, RV, IVCs are dilated. So IVC more than 2.1 centimeters. Uh, less collapsibility is indicative of severe TR. The jet area is more than 10. We see it more than 0.7. PISA radius more than 0.9. And systolic reversal of hepatic venous flow. All these are indicators of severe TR. What is important is there is no stage A. There is no stage A. So when there is functional, once if there is functional TR, then if it starts from stage B, there is no stage A in this. So there are three progressive functional TR, asymptomatic severe TR and symptomatic severe TR. So if at all we have this functional TR, which is progressive, severe TR, asymptomatic or symptomatic, we need to address it. It is generally by, done by tricuspid valve repair and or replacement when the cusp morphology is very poor. So when to perform, we all know when there is a left-sided heart surgery, the different grades of recommendation, we all can see this. Um, they are available. These guidelines are available on net. So this is uh, De Vega's repair, where this is the this is ASD. Just ignore this ASD. So where this is what surgeon has done. So just leaving this area, this area, to prevent the conduction system blocks. This is post repair. So this is the change that we see after tricuspid valve repair. So the different kinds of grading. Now we've got massive. We've got torrential. In the torrential ones. Uh, it is important that the regurgitant volume is more than 75 ml and VC is more than 2 centimeters. So torrential and massive ones, they have to be addressed. They have to be addressed to decrease morbidity and mortality in these patients. Tricuspid stenosis is very, very less common. But if the gradient is more than 5, then it is labeled as severe TS. So future directions are, uh, in today's era, it is 3D, 4D, 3D dimensional is very important. And intracardiac echocardiography is now upcoming, where all the interventions and monitoring is real time is done uh, with intracardiac echocardiography. So this was a very good article given by Zedi et al, where they've done the echocardiographic assessment of the tricuspid and pulmonary valves. And this gives a very, very comprehensive review for uh, and guidelines for the assessment of tricuspid. And this is one of the suggested readings. So now we come to pulmonary valve. It is again trileaflet. This is the smallest valve having anterior, right, and left cusps. Leaflets, see, this is like uh, quite similar to aortic valve, but the leaflets are very thin. And this is most difficult valve to image by most technique due to its position between the right ventricular outflow tract and the pulmonary artery. So this was given, uh, this article came in Jepe in, uh, by Dr. Vishwas Malik, where he's given all the challenges and the different views where uh, we can see the pulmonary valves. So when do we assess pulmonary valves? Means uh, there are two common scenarios where we assessment of pulmonary valves is very, very important. Apart from all the complex congenital heart disease, 
this is very important uh, in all the cases of talk which we are doing daily on a routine basis where we need to know the pulmonary valve the stenosis is at rvot level the pulmonary valve level if it is like supravalvular and uh, even after repair they they generally make monocuspid valves uh, to prevent uh, post operative pulmonary regurgitation so we have to assess that and the other scenario is the ross procedure in which the native pulmonary valve is replaced um, the aortic valve is replaced by native pulmonary valve in all the cases of congenital problems with the aortic valve it is replaced by the pulmonary valve so in all those cases the assessment of pulmonary valve is very very important now another scenario is when the adult cardiac patients are coming especially with congenital heart disease with late onset presentation or they are follow up of the congenital heart disease so in all uh, advances in all these all the percutaneous interventions especially in the follow up cases so that has also added on to our uh, precise measurement of, uh, of the pulmonary valve lesions and pathologies uh, prior to all these percutaneous interventions so how is pulmonary valve uh, echocardiography different it's a bit of challenge just because uh, the probe is in the esophagus and the pulmonary valve is the anterior most so at time this distance from the transducer t is maybe a problem the complex anatomy and morphology of the pulmonary valve and rvot as i already discussed in top and none of the views uh, we can have the three leaflets uh, by 2d echo yes in 3d we will be able to see but not in the 2d echo and earlier we were going for epicardial imaging but now we've got 3d transthoracic so transthoracic uh, is a better is a better way of assessing the pulmonary valve just because it is the anterior most and we put the probe just anterior to the chest so similar to lvot rvot also includes subvalvular valvular and supravalvular tissues pulmonary valve lies in the middle of the rvot so pulmonary valve assessment is how many leaflets are there what is the motion what is the integrity if there is any mass if there is rvot obstruction so imaging of supravalvular and subvalvular tissues is very very important whenever it comes to chts so the different views are mid esophageal rv inflow outflow view i think this is the most commonly used view and in this pulmonary valve is oriented at 90 degrees so this is once you move your probe to 30 40 60 degrees uh, from the aortic valve short axis view we will have the rv inflow outflow view where i show this was the wrap around view where we could see the pulmonary valve nicely and in this view we can add on color so that we can see the pulmonary valve stenosis regurgitations uh, regurgitations the gradients um, the turbulence in the flow yes aortic valve short axis view slight when we slightly withdraw the probe we can have this view upper esophageal pulmonary valve long axis or aortic at short axis view where we generally see the pda this view is also very good to know the uh, the doppler assign uh, doppler alignment is very good so to know the gradients at the pulmonary valve this view is very good so and the transgastric pulmonary uh, valve view the probe is turned to the right and transducer is rotated 110 to 140 so in this the rvot and pulmonary valve appear in the long axis view so this is mid esophageal aortic valve short axis view we have the this is this is the probe and this is how we see so this is the tricuspid valve this is the aortic valve this is the uh, pulmonary valve over here and this is rv inflow outflow view and then we've got uh, in this this valve this is the upper this is the aortic valve short axis and this is when we rotate the probe we will have this view open so this is the uh, characteristic view the angle is c 44 degrees this is the tricuspid view of the aortic valve this is the tricuspid valve and here we can see the cusp of the uh, pulmonary valve so in this view only we can measure the size of the pulmonary valve the radius especially in ross procedure we just freeze it and the and we just measure the size at this level pulmonary valve annulus and the morphology of the pulmonary valves so this was a case report where they have uh, shown severe pr because of perforations of the pulmonary valve and look at the jet 
the color flow jet going from here to here. So this is long axis view where we've got, this is LV long axis view, we've got aortic valve here. This is right ventricle, this is, this is pulmonary valve over here. So this gives a very good view of the, for the assessment of the morphology of the pulmonary valve cusps. Here we can see there is slight turbulence over here. So once we will measure the gradient, we'll come to know about the gradient over here. This is upper esophageal pulmonary valve long axis view. Um, we generally take the probe on the aorta. We just withdraw it. Once the aorta becomes oblong, we just keep on changing the angle from like 50, 60, 70, 80, where we'll have this view. This is the pulmonary artery. This is the pulmonary uh, valve, where we can see the turbulence. Most probably this was tetralogy, where we can see the turbulence of flow in the pulmonary valve. So just trying to delineate those structures. So this is the aorta, this is the pulmonary artery, this is RVOT, and this is the pulmonary valve, this is pulmonary artery. So if, if we want to see PDA, there will be a communication here. And uh, if there is any, any problem with the pulmonary valve, we will have turbulence over here. We can have a continuous wave Doppler over here, and we can have the uh, measurements of gradients in this view. So mild PR is common, and this may lead to progressive RV dilatation and dysfunction with exercise intolerance, ventricular tachycardia. That is why we need to address. Nowadays, um, interventional cardiology is definitely um, intervening in these patients, especially um, in their uh, late decades of life, where they've gone surgical correction in their early years. So the practical tips is complex RV geometry is further distorted whenever we're doing a redo kind of thing for all these patients. So 3D transthoracic uh, image acquisition is good. And uh, just because this valve is anteriorly placed and the color dropler will give us the alignment with the vena contractor and precise identification and the uh, volume estimations. So to begin with the so, uh, severity of pulmonary valve regurgitation. So if when a contractor is more than six millimeter, and this is very important, when the jet width is more than 50% of the RVOT, the pressure half time is less than 200. The regurgitant fraction is more than 60%. All these are suggestive of severe PR. What about pulmonary stenosis? Yes, it is generally associated with the RVOT obstruction, subvalvular, valvular, or supravalvular in all the congenital heart disease. And uh, to begin with, it is the 2D transthoracic echo, but now we've got uh, 3D volume assessments where we can uh, have the uh, quantifications uh, in the PAV max. If, if the velocity is four meter per second, then obviously it is severe pulmonary stenosis. And uh, once we put color over there, we put pulse wave Doppler, so we will have the value, we will have the idea whether the turbulence is more than subvalvular, valvular, or supravalvular areas. And early PR velocity of more than 2.2 meters per second is also indicative of raised mean pulmonary artery pressure. And PhD less than 100, 200 is suggestive of severe PR. So this measurement is very important when, whenever we are measuring the PA uh, diameter. It is generally done in N diastole and uh, diameter of uh, average you will find around one to two centimeters. If it is like more than two, then there is severe PA dilatation. It may be seconded to pH. We've got pulmonary valve endocarditis, though it's very rare. But yes, at times you may find it. And it is a diagnostic challenge. Carcinoid valve, it may affect the pulmonary valve as it was affecting the um, tricuspid valve in the same way. And then there is another the cardiac valve tumor that is fibroelastoma. In this, um, all the valves, like aortic, mitral, tricuspid, pulmonary valve, though it is the last one, but then at times uh, we see the pathology here. So 3D echo is best one to delineate. So percutaneous pulmonary valve implantation, nowadays it is being done. Um, it is like innovative procedure just because uh, 
the uh, pediatric population that was operated in with congenital heart disease um, decades back now they present with severe pr with rv progressive rv dilatation so in all these cases uh, uh, with real uh, 3d time te uh, pulmonary uh, valve implantation or percutaneous interventions are being done to decrease the morbidity and mortality so comprehensive imaging of pulmonary valve remains challenging with one imaging modality which is not enough and we must have 3d echocardiograph and to the though it's a first um, line diagnostic tool the recommendations for 3d and 4d are on the way thank you sir thank you madam uh, that was an elaborate coverage of all the topics uh, the forum is open for discussion Uh, I don't see any questions from the chat box. Uh, so, anybody wants to ask any question, please unmute and uh, do that. And if you want to comment, also you're welcome to do that. Uh, good morning, sir. I have uh, one question. Yes, uh, sir. My question is um, uh, about the pre-op, like after induction. Like there are some borderline cases where uh, they, there is a patient we have planned for uh, mitral valve surgery, but the tricuspid we are doubtful. In one echo report in the transthoracic, it is mentioned mild to moderate and maybe just mild tricuspid annular dilatation. So at the time of induction, once we see the TE, what are the factors to tell us saying that, no, this patient, we have to tackle their tricuspid also? Very, very important question. Uh, Dr. Rachna, followed by... Yes, sir. Uh, so, ma'am, uh, I discussed that grading of severity is very, very important. So, to begin with, first thing, see the tricuspid valve cusp morphology. How are the cusps? What are the reasons for this tricuspid regurgitation? If the... What are the... What is the thickness of the cusp? What is the mobility of the cusp? What is the annular diameter? If suppose uh, annulus is more than four centimeter or index is more than 21, means 40 divided, uh, whatever is your TV annulus divided by body surface area. If that value is more than 21, then yes, we need to address. Second, whenever you are estimating uh, the jet area, the volume it is taking in RA, if it is like more than 10%, if it is more than 30% of the RA area, okay? How is the continuous wave signal over there? Continuous wave Doppler over there. And uh, we all know that uh, after induction of anesthesia, the, the severity of tricuspid regurgitation, the presentation may not be same as it was in transthoracic. At times, uh, there is a lower grade of tricuspid regurgitation when we see after induction of general anesthesia. But then, even despite that, if we see the severe TR over there, if the vinoc contractor is more than seven, effective regurgitant uh, volume is more than 40 ml, we need to address the tricuspid valve, especially when we are undergoing the uh, left heart surgery. You see the uh, values of uh, IVC diameter, if it is like more than 2.1, whether it is well collapsing or not, if it is less collapsing, then also you need to address the tricuspid valve. So these are very important parameters. Uh, and there was a question when to address tricuspid regurgitation. Now there are two limitations. If the patient has got atrial fibrillation, your values of TR may not be those obvious. You will have to again quantify. And if you've got 3D, then volume assessment with 3D will be a very good. And if the jet is not central, in the cases of eccentric jet also, the values which you are aiming for correction, they may not be like you may not aim at them because there will be underestimation in the cases of eccentric jets. Is that okay, ma'am? Madam, I'll add on a point. Uh, yes, Madam, uh, we have to follow Colombo's criteria, that is about 21 meter, uh, millimeter per second, irrespective of presence or absence of TR. Yes, I sir. think we address all the tricuspid valves based on this criteria. This is one of the easier way to, there won't be any doubt. I hope uh, this is a 
Yes, sir. Uh, good morning, madam. Uh, regarding the same this thing, I have one more question. Um, if the annulus is less than 40, but indexed is more than 21 with mild to moderate TR, uh, it should be addressed? Yes, as Sarah has uh, said, we need yes. to follow those criteria. Yes. And uh, you see, this is one. This is one criteria. Go for other criteria also. If there is any doubt, do not stick to one criteria that indexes this. Just see the right ventricular size, the right atrial size, and uh, see the hepatic veins, see the IVC diameter. So it the indexing has to be addressed, no doubt. But then you add on to other parameters with a comprehensive view, convincing surgeon that yes, it is required. Okay, madam. Yes, okay, thank you, madam. Okay. Madam, it is mild and severe will not be having in doubt. It is the moderate one we have to be. The I know, sir. It is so severe, everyone will be addressing. So, uh, with the moderate, uh, I think this indexing is indexing IVC diameters and hepatic venous flow. So, even if there is systolic blunting, so uh, we will have to see um, yeah, and the RL alterations. Qualitative, quantitative, morphology, everything we have to see. Probably. Yes, definitely, sir. Also, ma'am, if uh, if the like like Dr. Rakesh was saying, we are thinking of it is a borderline case of TR. If the indexed uh, tricuspid annulus is high, or uh, plus or minus, if the PA pressure is also high, even then we have to go in and tackle. So yeah. so many factors like you mentioned. So I think take the new things we learned today is what you were talking about that that RA volume jet you said forty percent, right? Yeah, yeah, ma'am. But this is not new. Yeah, new things something. are like yeah, yeah. Uh, I will uh, if sir will give me the opportunity next time I'll be come we've got a 4D machine now so next time it will it's all be so daily it's... volume assessments yeah. and that yeah. came in 2017 so it is six years back so today uh, we are working more on uh, 3D volume assessments so uh, another one year I think we will have all the recommendations and guidelines based on. 3D. Just because tricuspid valve is very complex, and uh, I, I don't, uh, please don't mind, sir. But then uh, surgeons, uh, they always think that uh, once we've corrected the left-sided lesions, the right-sided will be okay. But then in the post-operative period in ICU, you see when there is a situs and there is hepatomegaly, deranged liver functions, coagulopathy, just attributed to severe TR. So uh, I think we need to address, we need to deline it, we need to convince the surgeon at times, and uh, just because of the morbidity mortality, and uh, though there are different data, but still it is like seven to nine percent of the surgical patients where we have morbidity attributed to post-operative TR, which is a significant number. So I think convincing on OT table and uh, the surgeons. Um, having a look and but yes you should have your at least five or six data to convince the surgeons means high rvsps the ivc diameter the hepatic venous the indexing the ra size the rv size wow. i've given you all the cutoffs even in the four chamber view the rv value cutoffs at the mid level they all are very important nowadays we go for rv strains also rv ejection fraction also rv shortening fractional area shortening, all these. And uh, uh, with our newer machines, it is not difficult. You, you just need to know what you should do, but that's it. And uh, the, the calculations also, now um, uh, they're not so difficult. Believe me, means doing it regularly, um, you will have an knack of it. Uh, Dr. Rakesh, do you want to respond to that? Uh, Dr. Rachna mentioned that we need to convince the surgeons. <laughs> Uh, so this is not a debate. This is uh, just uh, uh, I, I totally agree comment that, that a number of times we tell no, the surgeon, say, what say, don't worry, we've be. addressed left side, you don't worry, uh, the patient will be uh, fine. Sir, absolutely right. I totally agree with Madam. We have seen what exactly okay. you said in the post-op, we do see a lot of patients uh, having uh, avid dysfunction, then TIA, a lot of morbidity. So uh, that gives me to ask Madam. So when we when we uh, when we do a tricuspid repair, it is the moderate one whether to go back in whether to address or not. So that is where I wanted to ask, madam, whether I have to go back in or not, or let just leave it. If madam can uh, give some points on that, we have done a repair, mild. I I can 
moderate severe definitely i have to go back but it's a moderate which is borderline whether to go in or leave it so what are the insights or madam give to god and that is the important one because we know that post op it will give problem mm -hmm. so in moderate also uh, i think uh, i've given all the criteria and if we have 3d then 3d volume assessment it is mandatory nowadays actually hello yeah yeah please continue yes so sir 3d volume estimations they are the better ones um, with 2d uh, just because we go for single plane and the volume estimations they are just estimations so the precision is very less so the new recommendations will be based on uh, the 3d volume assessments um, and yes uh, obviously as we all know the tricuspid valve replacement is generally avoided just because of the thrombotic complications thromboembolic complications right side is a low pressure chamber low flow chamber so the chances of thromboembolism are very high so the surgeons uh, they are like uh, they and everyone like uh, they want to defer the tricuspid valve replacement unless and until the cusmophology is very bad that the cusp there can be no reconstruction of the valve leaflets so and if it is like annular dilatation we've got case repair we've got the vegas repair and uh, if the if the ring of all the dilatation is uh, significant then yes i showed you the tricuspid and the ring rings are being placed and even the interventional cardiologist they are doing end to end repairs h to h repair of the tricuspid valve they are also inserting rings so uh, all these procedures they can be done and uh, best thing um, best information to ctva surgeons is that even if you are leaving tricuspid valves the cardiologist people in the post operative period once they coming back they are like taking up interventional cardiology for tricuspid valve repairs um, even if they are being left <laughs> hello hello yes yes yeah So somebody is asked. If it is, yeah, yeah, I am Dr. Deepak. I am cardiac surgeon. Ah, uh, see, if if it is moderate TR, yeah, we have to add this. Yeah. Well, first of all, see, otherwise lung will get damaged. I I agree. I agree. Yeah. Shall we go to the chat box questions? What is the acceptable residual TR post DVEGA? uh right mild is acceptable uh, see the velocity if the velocity in the continuous uh, go to mediesophageal uh, bicaval modified bicaval view see the uh, continuous wave doppler if the velocity is say less than 2 the gradients are less uh, rvsp is like 10 15 20 uh, peak then uh, go ahead then uh, that is okay and uh, actually this is a very good question what is important is that uh, at times whenever the repair is being done it may lead to tricuspid stenosis also so you may accept mild tr that is okay but don't accept tricuspid stenosis that is most important thing mild tr will be accepted and uh, if it was torrential tr massive tr if it is like mild to moderate also then also the patient will be symptomatically relieved okay so mild tr and uh, values less than 20 are well accepted if you on the continuous wave doppler so then you can measure the area also for this the divega divegas is obsolete now because of the Correct. because of the newer rings like the saddle ring which are there yes. in the market the three dimensional yes sir. very very few instances you do and as madam said definitely we should never accept ts That TR is better tolerated than it. Right, right. How do you measure pH without TR? I can't on echo. But yes, you have um, to guess it by using the pulmonary acceleration time. Pulmonary acceleration. No, we yeah, can measure pulmonary. the pulmonary uh, valve, the pulmonary artery uh, diameter, and at times if it is dilated more than twenty five, one centimeter above the valve. that too is also indicative of uh, pH. Right, right. in the aortic uh, aortic arch 
short axis view when you see the pulmonary artery if you place the pw where you will get the pulmonary acceleration time usually lesser the pulmonary acceleration time greater is the pa pressure and there is a equation to get the approximate pulmonary artery pressure using the pulmonary acceleration time what is the simplest way to measure ph is one question what is simplest method uh, just put a condensed wave, uh, wave doppler in uh, modified by kevel view and that is the simplest way with v max uh, you if suppose v max is 3 then the rvsp is 4v square plus right atrial pressures so oh, this, this is the simplest way one thing is sir do you want to do te before induction for better estimation of pr t uh, will be cumbersome uh, before induction why not transthoracic transthoracic is means uh, expertise for transthoracic is required but uh, why the patient will be under okay. anesthesia okay. usually it is done one day prior to just to uh, know the confirm the diagnosis and get uh, maximum information one yes. day prior tt is uh, good enough yes i think so Doctor Akesh, what do you do? Do you do T before induction of anesthesia? No, no, sir. We don't practice. No, yes, we no, do no. try. We don't. Have no, sir. This is hypothesized that under anesthesia the values may change. But I think apart from um, constrictive pericarditis, that is the only scenario where uh, those septal bounds and everything is lost under anesthesia. Rest all other conditions. Uh, T. and all those assessments uh, can be under done under anesthesia tr grade will come down just it like will come down but then we got not only tr we got other contributory factors we got assessment of other factors also so it is a complex kind of thing and uh, i really don't know if we should put that invasive uh, before induction uh, of anesthesia yeah. the next question is in the, is complementing your presentation wonderful you. presentation is slow pr assessment with lower heart rate with mitral stenosis accurate how is this uh, tr assessment with uh, tr assessment with lower heart rates yes it will be acceptable uh, like if it is like severe bradycardia it may not be but 60 to 70 yes you will be able to assess but i think i missed upon one thing that uh, mm, whenever we coming off the tr may be induced by pacemaker so pacemaker induced tr entity is also quite common means yes. out of say once in one or two months you will be able to see this so the patient was having mild tr you coming off bypass so there was a conduction block you added on pacemaker now you can see it is like moderate to severe tr so you just contemplating what to do what to do by the time you trying to you know manage uh, all other factors and once the sa av nodal synchrony appears and that tr disappears so, so i think i just forgot that entity yeah, yeah, that right. is Thank very very important that. and we do see uh, in practical scenarios a number of times this pacemaker induced tr you're right so yeah. this is very important to keep this in mind that uh, whenever we are applying leads so you talking about uh, low heart rate but you apply the pacemaker then the pacemaker may add on to this tr so it is very important that you should have this thing in mind yeah i would like to make a couple of comments uh, yes, these, these are not questions in patients who are undergoing mitral valve surgery if they have undergone um, balloon valvuloplasty in the past you might have to look for uh, the breach in the atrial septum something like asd may be present because of the previous balloon valvuloplasty yes sir that is one comment when you are looking at the tricuspid valve you can as well look at the septum and see second thing is after the tricuspid valve repair if you want to pass a pa catheter it becomes somewhat tricky yes sir so if the patient uh, is a potential candidate who needs pa catheter it must be inserted before the repair of the valve Mm. third uh, comment i would like to make is if you are make doing a surgery on the left side moderate degree of tr must be addressed yes sir and the fourth comment is that if the patient has severe tr after the patient had undergone 
left sided surgery some time ago as you said we can go for the percutaneous procedures without opening the chest yes uh, there is one question about uh, how much tr is acceptable on pulmonary valve replacement in post tetralogy repair patients how much tr again it is like mild but then we will have to see all other factors that may be contributing to tr so at this uh, generally top patients are very small so you need to quantify tr but the surgeons they have already opened the rv let them assess if you already found that let them assess the subvalvular apparatus just because once the rv is open you have access to it they can see the septal uh, at this age if there is tr so i suspect it is not because of left sided lesions it i suspect there may be primary tr there may be associated abscesses there may be associated cus morphology so the surgeon has already opened rv just ask him to have a look at the cus morphology if the cus morphology is not good then tr interventions may be required but believe me i have not seen surgeons doing any tr intervention while operating top do we found mild tr in n number of patients so unless and until the cus morphology is disturbed we should not disturb it i think so this is what is thank my you. practical experience thank so you ramsha for that response there yes. are two questions uh, i need a quick answers and then we will wind up because we are yes, cross the time limit the first question is uh, ricus prandus more than 40 mm is taken as dilatation or more than 21 mm square meter is taken which is better indexing is better index is better i, I indexing is better Next there is no doubt about yeah. it no doubt right. what is acceptable in maximum pressure gradient after tr repair see maximum pressure gradient don't accept more than 20 uh, see if more than 20 it will again come in ph so if it is under anesthesia more than 20 then i, I think uh, this refers to the stenosis bit of it stenosis the pressure bit. gradient across the tricuspid valve after pressure TR. gradient across the tricuspid valve see yes. tricuspid valve the pressure gradient is very low like uh, more than 2 more than 5 is considered significant ts so if it is like more than 4 and 5 you need to address any response yes. from dr rakesh it should be a bit less than 2 sir less than uh, i agree it should be less than 2 yeah that's that's the best request i think we have uh, come to the end of the session i would like to thank uh, dr rachna vadva and dr rakesh uh, Uh, Rakesh Naik for being with us. It was an excellent session with a lot of discussion, and we learned a lot of new um, aspects of tricuspid valve assessment and pulmonary valve assessment. And uh, I wish a good Sunday. Have a good Sunday, and we'll meet again on next Sunday. Thank, Thank you, you, sir. Thank you for giving me this opportunity. It was wonderful interacting uh, with you, Dr. Naik. Thank, Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rakesh. Thank you. Thank you.